This program is brought to you by Emory University. Good morning. Uh, welcome to this morning's uh, Emory Cardiovascular Grand Round Series. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce my colleague and friend, Abhishek Deshmukh from uh, Mayo Clinic, Rochester, Minnesota. Uh, he is going to be talking to us today about sarcoid heart disease, the role of arrhythmias, and how to treat. Abhishek actually has a fantastic research career with uh, in excess of uh, 250 publications on uh, which predominantly come from this uh, large data set uh, that uh, he's been working on over the years uh, with the national inpatient sample. Subsequently, he has moved on to look at other data, data sets as well. He is a clinical electrophysiologist and has a number of significant publications in this era, area as well. Um, without uh, further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Deshmukh. Yeah, good morning, everybody. And I hope you guys are having a nice uh, morning. It's a little bit early here, and I saw some snow frost in the morning when I drove here. So hopefully, you know, uh, you guys are having a better weather. I'm going to talk about sarcoid heart disease, a role of arrhythmias, and how to treat. And uh, you know, among some of the hats I wear, one of the things I do is I'm kind of co-director of the sarcoid clinic and basically deal with the arrhythmias. So really, uh, no disclosures for this. And our learning objectives are review burden of arrhythmias in patients with uh, sarcoidosis, evaluate the role of device therapy, immunosuppression, and ablation. And then finally, how to risk stratify a patient with uh, sarcoid or specifically cardiac sarcoid. Now again, full disclosure, I'm not an imager or, or I don't do immunosuppression, but just wanted to highlight how a role of cardiac electrophysiologist can be sometimes paramount in management of some of these inflammatory cardiomyopathies. So we'll start off with a case of a 54-year-old female with a, a college professor. She noted her heart rate to be in 40s on Fitbit, and she was sort of proud of her fitness level that her heart rate remained in 40s. But then over a period of time, she complained of shortness of breath, fatigue, and near syncope, during her long classes and exercise. So with this, she got evaluated because with, she was concerned with the episode of syncope. <clears throat> so this was a presenting ECG. As you can clearly notice sinus rhythm going on, uh, complete heart block um, and some infraisian conduction system disease. And look at some of these notchings, what we see in the inferior and the lateral leads, V523 AVF. So in this setting, unusual presentation, young lady, fairly fit, coming in with complete heart block, likely infrahisian conduction system disease. So when you look at the causes of AV block in middle-aged individuals, it can be degenerative, such as uh, Langer's disease, Lev disease, certain infectious causes, rheumatic and autoimmune disease, specifically giant cell myocarditis, ankylosing spondylitis, rheumatoid arthritis, infiltrative conditions such as amyloid and sarcoid and various tumors, neuromuscular dystrophies can sometimes present with complete heart block. And more common, probably what you might see in our practice is going to be radiation-induced uh, uh, AV conduction disease. In this setting, young lady coming in with complete heart block, she got some of the testing done, ejection fraction was normal, 60%. So she underwent a dual chamber pacemaker. So this is a pacemaker, but on her X-ray, you may not notice to see a little bit of hilar prominence uh, uh, on her X-ray. Now, young patients with advanced AV block, there's actually a recommendation that we should screen these patients, especially patients younger than 60 years of age with unexplained second degree, uh, morbids two or third degree AV block can be useful to screen for a cardiac sarcoidosis. And if the initial screening tests are suggestive of sarcoidosis, then we should try to get a biopsy, which can be more confirmative as far as getting a diagnosis is concerned. So just as an outline about how to do, what should be the workflow when you encounter somebody with kind of a com uh, advanced AV block or a complete heart block in a young patient. So after you do the needful and take care of the patient, consider doing a high resolution CT scan or other further advanced cardiac imaging, such as MRI or PET scan. If the CT scan is suggestive of pulmonary sarcoidosis or if the PET or the MRI is suggestive of sarcoidosis, 
then I, then I, the, then you, you know you can start to treat it. So in our patient, you know there were some lymph nodes which light, uh, lit up, and the findings were consistent with cardiac sarcoid. Another key thing in a physical exam in these patients is we have to palpate for every lymph node what we were doing in medical school because you will be surprised to know that at least in this lady, when we are trying to put in the temporary pacemaker at night to get her ready for the permanent device in the morning, one of our trainees actually felt some lymph nodes, which were subsequently uh, biopsy. So although the CT scan and a PET scan was suggestive of enlarged lymph nodes and ongoing inflammation, just based on physical exam, as a lymph node was noted, a biopsy was performed, and that biopsy showed clearly non-caseating uh, granuloma here. So a lot of us don't look at pathology films every day now, but this, as you can see, is like a non-necrotizing uh, granuloma and composed of these epithelioid histiocytes. And just as a reference, this is how normal lymphocytes are going to look like. So this is kind of a classic non-caseating granuloma, which is very suggestive of sarcoidosis. Again, with high power magnification, you can see this again non-necrotizing granuloma comp uh, composed of these tight epithelioid uh, histiocytes. And once you have that, then at least a diagnosis is done that this patient indeed, ha indeed has sarcoidosis with possible uh, with cardiac involvement as she presented with uh, AV block. Now the diagnostic criteria for cardiac sarcoidosis is evolving. The initial, uh, uh, initial reports were from Japan as there was a lot of sarcoid seen in Japan. And then subsequently, Heart Rhythm Society had a, had a guideline out there. And both of them kind of overlap in a lot of ways, but specifically from EP and heart rhythm standpoint, whenever there is advanced AV block, young patient, or again, spontaneous or uh, inducible VT, unexplained low EF, Mobitz type 2, Mobitz type 3 block, then start, especially young patient, then start to think whether this patient is going to have sarcoid. And then subsequently, all of them go over all the imaging criteria, which can be helpful uh, to make a further diagnosis. Now, histo histological diagnosis is also going to be critical to see whether we can find that non-caseating granuloma. And then we'll talk about how to biopsy and some of the challenges which are there uh, in, that, in that regard. So coming back to our patient, so young lady got a dual chamber pacemaker and then was discharged home. But you know, because of these high left prominence, we thought of doing a CT scan and PET scan, which kind of showed the lymph nodes. So what should be the next step? Should we upgrade her to an ICD? Should we, should we upgrade her to a biventricular ICD? Should we start treating her for, with immunosuppression or nothing to do because we already treated her complete heart block? Now, again, she, her EF was normal 60%, but now she's going to be rendered pacemaker dependent. If you look at the CRT indications for EF between, say, 36 to 50%, then really, you know, there is some benefit uh, based on the block HF trial. And now that's part of the guidelines that if, you are, if somebody is anticipated to have more than 40% of ventricular pacing with EF between 36 to 50%, then we could consider a CRT. But again, our patient, her ejection fraction was 60%. So she couldn't fit this criteria. And so we, uh, we did, did not do a biventricular device on her. So what else can we do? Well, based on the ACC AHA guidelines, she, we know she has potential cardiac sarcoidosis. She did not have any sudden cardiac death. Her EF is more than 35, but she did have kind of a near syncope she was a pacemaker candidate and she is a pacemaker candidate, actually got a pacemaker already. And in that setting, now that we have a more conclusive diagnosis that we might be dealing with sarcoidosis, we have to do an ICD or we should consider doing an ICD on this patient. So she went home and then we had to call her back again. And then subsequently we upgraded her device to a dual chamber uh, ICD. And then uh, she did fine for a while. So just looking at sarcoidosis, little bit of pathophysiology behind that. Uh, sarcoidosis is caused by an antigen trigger along with some genetic predisposition. And there have been various factors which have been implicated such as occupational or environmental or infectious or genetic, but we really don't know the actual mechanism of, of behind sarcoidosis. We do now know that the central role of uh, uh, in this disease progression is really an exaggerated immune response characterized by aggregation of these uh, T cells. 
and macrophages, and finally you get this non-caseating granuloma. Now, granulomas uh, are important. That may suggest that that might be diagnostic, but really what we want to target is the inflammation. And the certain, uh, the central role, role in early development and progression is really attributed to the immune response and the degree of inflammation. And then this degree of inflammation is leveraged for diagnosis using MRI or PET scan for treatment using uh, immunosuppression. And also this inflammation itself is going to be a risk for developing say ventricular arrhythmias or to develop a complete heart block. So although sarcoidosis is uncommon and it can affect lungs predominantly, cardiac involvement is also fairly note of, it's fairly seen commonly now, again, because of better uh, imaging techniques such as PET and MRI. So cardiac sarcoid is rare. So we are looking at rare of a rare disease and 2.5 to 5% with sarcoidosis will have some cardiac involvement. But it turns out a lot of patients, one fourth of patients uh, with sarcoidosis, when they have an autopsy, they would have cardiac uh, involvement. More common in men and more common kind of in mid, mid range age, say 47 years of age was what we noted at least from our, uh, our, 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 our review here. Symptoms can be heart failure, symptoms can be syncope, symptoms can be arrhythmia, but the most important symptom again, it's probably going to be fatigue. And that is related to the ongoing inflammation. Like for example, patients with rheumatoid arthritis, they, their main symptom beyond the joint pain is going to be fatigue, likely related to the inflammation. Same thing with sarcoidosis, like beyond some of the concerning symptoms, if they have fatigue, then that should tune you up to suggest that why is this patient fatigued and you know, that may re result in further evaluation. Now there are a lot of uh, uh, EP issues which happen with sarcoid, so bundle branch blocks, heart blocks, complete heart block, BT, and you know these would be kind of a more profound presentation when they happen. ECG, however, is a lot of times abnormal even with a clinical sarcoid and even with a clinically silent sarcoid. So you know although the ECG may not show any of these profound conditions such as heart blocks and arrhythmias, but ECG can still be a little bit abnormal. And how to and how to assess that? Now the granulomas in sarcoid can happen anywhere. It can happen in the atrium. It can happen in the ventricle. It can happen in the right ventricle, left ventricle. But it really likes the septum. It has significant predilection that it's going to hang out mostly in the septum, and subsequently in the left ventricle and kind of left ventricular anterior anteroseptal uh, location. Now, how can we leverage this for an ECG? So this is a different patient, again, has, uh, has cardiac sarcoid, does not, has right bundle branch block, maybe a little bit of PR prolongation. But if you look here, that you start to look at these unusual patterns called as some delayed conduction or fractionated QRS, which can be seen. Now, if this is seen in certain leads, then that may point out that there is some slow conduction or disease conduction going on. Now, we all know that in the heart, when a vector is going from, say, one point to another point, as it is going towards an electrode, it's going to make a positive wave. But in its wavefront, as it is going towards that electrode, if there is some scar or if there is some abnormal tissue, the wavefront is going to go slowly as it reaches that electrode. That slowing of the velocity of the slowing of the conduction velocity or the slowing of that wavefront is going to cause this slow conduction, which is manifested as fractionated QRS on the ECG. Now, how can we use it for cardiac conditions, what we deal with? Well, with acute ischemia or infarct, we kind of figure that out depending on the territory of location. But again, for sarcoid, because it involves septum a lot of times, we can look at the septal leads. So we know V1 is the anterior most lead. But V2 and V3 are going, to, are going to kind of help us to know where the, are kind to uh, reflect the septal uh, leads. So if you have this notching or some delayed conduction or fractionated QRS going on in lead V2 and V3, then we should start to think that uh, you may have some slowing conduction and that may point out to certain pathologies which are seen in that location. Sarcoid can also affect the inferior interolateral lead, but again, it's going to be somewhat patchy so you may not get like a complete QS pattern or a Q, like what you would get in an inferior wall MR or an anterior wall MI, but because of more patchy involvement, 
you may not you may just get it in maybe one or two ecg leads and that might be your clue especially when you're trying to ascertain whether this patient has any abnormal underlying substrate to result in for subsequent arrhythmias so let's talk about the role of device therapy immunosuppression and ablation in patients with sarcoid now the way eps think of sarcoidosis is really dependent on if the patient has an av block like our patient had then let's give them a pacemaker or a defibrillator if they have ventricular arrhythmias then let's treat them with antiarrhythmics or ablation or some sort of immunomodulator working with our heart failure colleagues but even more so important is our role in diagnosis and risk stratification and we'll talk a little bit about ep study and then ep guided biopsy now after the small patchy uh, basal involvement when most of the time the uh, the picture is kind of going to be clinically silent sarcoid is also quite a dynamic and a progressive disease it can progress with large area of septal involvement and if the septum gets involved more likelihood that the patient may have heart block but may also have septal vts as you start to have more progression of uh, sarcoid you're going to have more granulomas more fibrosis so more granuloma and more fibrosis is going to result in further slowing of conduction in the heart that's going to promote reentry and that's going to promote more ventricular tachycardia and beyond of time when you have more extensive involvement of the left ventricle or right ventricle or both then patients are going to present more with heart failure symptoms because of low ejection fraction so there are opportunities at every step in the way to make a diagnosis to probably halt the progression of the disease oh, no. and subsequently to try to see how best we can palliate somebody when they are having more arrhythmias or more heart failure symptoms but the prognosis is re related to the ventricular involvement so the more the ventricular involvement lower the ejection fraction more severe the heart failure symptoms more likelihood oh, that these okay. people are going to have a poor outcome from a cardiac sarcoid now why what happens in the septum now this is a kind of a four chamber view of the heart with right atrium left atrium right ventricle left ventricle sarcoid tends to hang out more in the septum guess what else is in on the septum well on the septum which your you have interventricular septum you or muscular septum but you also have the membranous septum which is quite close to this septal area and av node and his bundle like uh, kind of hangs out in this location so if you have any inflammation edema it's going to involve this location the av node the his bundle and that's the reason why they get complete heart block the sarcoid is unique that not many inflammatory cardiomyopathies would be would be so predisposed to cause complete heart block or av block uh, except for say sarcoid and because of the septal involvement as you may get more vt here but also because it's proximity to the av conduction system more chance of av blocks and other intraavian conduction system disease so when to treat somebody with ongoing inflammation well if there is evidence of active inflammation we can treat it if the patient is symptomatic which they are definite or probable of presumed cardiac sarcoid we can check or we can treat them but treating an asymptomatic patient especially with all the immunosuppression is kind of controversial at this point and again you cannot make somebody who is asymptomatic feel better but you can certainly make them feel worse by giving them all the immunosuppression which can be given so just a couple of lines on immunosuppression steroids are usually recommended there is really no randomized control trial and no proven uh, survival benefit the dose is unknown and the duration of steroid and whether they need tapering is also unknown but what is known sometimes is that steroids can actually help in trying to see if it can restore av conduction so again this because of the septal involvement there is inflammation steroids can reduce the inflammation and that can in some patients can cause some re recovery of the av conduction not all but in some but as they appear to have some beneficial role to a, uh, to resolve the av conduction can we stop giving them pacemakers and just give them steroids and see what happens you know good thought but actually the response rate is quite unpredictable and there is a higher chance of recurrence and at least based on the guidelines if somebody has an av block the recommendation is to implant a device 
and then try to see whether we could uh, uh, give immunosuppression after that. Now, the problem with immunosuppression is, again, it's going to risk, uh, increase the risk of device infection. So, the, so the idea is we should implant the device first, and once the incision is healed up well, then the immunosuppression can be started. But do all patients require a, a, a pacemaker or a defibrillator? That's going to be the main question. There are certain steroid sparing agents which can also be uh, which can also be used, and again, this has to be done in collaboration with a heart failure di a cardiologist or a rheumatologist or a pulmonary pulmonary doctor who might be more uh, uh, up to date with the role of all these immunosuppression medications. So let's look at the uh, indications of ICD and cardiac sarcoid. So let's see if this patient needs an ICD. So 44 year old gentleman with the pulmonary sarcoid this time. He had an active FDG PET on the lateral wall. There is also delayed enhancement on a cardiac MRI in the same intralateral uh, wall. No arrhythmias, no syncope, no conduction abnormalities. EF is 55%. Should we give him an ICD? So these are kind of patients which we sometimes get consulted on to see whether these patients need an ICD and whether we can justify it based on our guidelines. Well, the easy indications for ICD, somebody has died and come back to tell you the story that he died and came back, secondary prevention, they should get an ICD. EF less than 35% with good medical management and immunosuppression, again, they, can, they will get an ICD. So those are kind of the easy indications. The places where it is kind of doable or class 2A indication would be somebody who needs a pacemaker. Well, instead of a pacemaker, we can give them an ICD. And why is that? We'll talk about that. Somebody who has near syncope, which is thought to be because of arrhythmia, arrhythmogenic etiology, specific ventricular arrhythmias, then they can be considered for an ICD. And if you have an inducible monomorphic ventricular tachycardia, a kind of a clinically relevant polymorphic VTVF, then these patients can be considered for an ICD. So again, our patient had normal ejection fraction. Now, for moderately reduced ejection fraction, say less than, say, between 36 and 49 percent, then maybe it can be done based on what we find on a cardiac MRI and on an EP study. So, back to our patient, normal EF, he did have late gadolinium enhancement on MRI, and he has no arrhythmias. So, the recommendation is that if there is normal ejection fraction and if there is late gadolinium enhancement, then maybe an EP study can be done. And if the EP study is positive, then we can consider an ICD, kind of a class 2B indication. So we got him to our lab. We did an EP study, and his, uh, and his EP study was positive. So he got implanted with a subcutaneous ICD. And the story will continue to evolve. Now, ICDs in sarcoid, we know when to give them now. But who are the people who are going to get ICD shots? Well, it turns out that patients who had low ejection fraction and patients who had complete heart block at baseline uh, were at more risk for having ICD therapies. And the ICD therapies were quite high in number, about 15% per year, which is significantly higher in other run-of-the-mill non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. So again, these patients will be at a higher risk for having ventricular arrhythmias. So low ejection fraction, heart block would be the risk factor and really not primary versus secondary prevention for sudden cardiac death. Low EF and heart block would be the main risk factors to have ICD therapies. Now, in another group, it, has, it was shown that, again, apart from low ejection fraction, the other reasons could be symptomatic heart failure. And if you have right ventricular involvement in sarcoid, they are going to be the people beyond low EF who are going to have higher risk for having complete heart block, or higher risk for having ventricular arrhythmias. So when do these people get VT? Well, if you kind of look at a five-year a five uh, follow-up on patients with sarcoidosis, it turns out that the maximum events happen within the first 12 months and more so within the first six months of treatment. The recurrence rate of these events are also high. Now, that's why whenever there's an indication for pacemaker and plan is to start immunosuppression, Based on this data, it appears that ICD is going to be more helpful because a lot of these patients are going to get VT in the first three to six months with a higher recurrence rate. And that's why instead of a pacemaker, ICD is given whenever there's an indication for a, a cardiac uh, or some sort of cardiac device. 
Now, when patients have high degree AV block, you know, uh, people, uh, it's been looked at that if even if your ejection fraction is low and there is inducible VT or VT is present, you have more chance of having a recurrent VT. But it turns out even if you have heart block with the kind of a normal EF and no ventricular tachycardia, at five years, about nine to 10% of patients are actually going to have ventricular tachycardia. Again, uh, suggesting that in patients with high degree AV block, if you want to implant a pacemaker, these patients actually would benefit more from a defibrillator because of higher risk of recurrence of ventricular tachycardia. And the risk is significant with AV blocks with or without uh, initial VT or heart failure uh, symptoms. So again, Mr. Jones, he got an subcutaneous ICD and this actually happened this year it, in July, he went home and then he called us back as he was having an ICD shock. So he clearly went into this uh, ventricular tachycardia quite rapid, 240 milliseconds near syncope and got a shock. And then what do we do? Well, we gave him, uh, he was getting his, uh, he was still on his immunosuppression, but he was starting to get recurrent ICD shocks. This was at least three to four months after initial uh, diagnosis. We, we gave him antiarrhythmics, we gave him amiodarone. Despite this, he was still having recurrent ICD shocks. So we brought him to a lab for an ablation. So this is when we put our multi-electrode mapping catheter at the area of abnormal, uh, at, at an abnormal area. So you can see the normal QRS. And we, when we looked at this fractionated QRS complex, we looked at how abnormal conduction is going to cause delayed activation and that can get reflected on a surface ECG lead. So same thing, the same principle is applied when we map in the ventricle. So this is a normal ventricular signal, but you can see all these late potentials, what we are seeing here. This is suggestive of slowing of conduction and abnormal substrate in that, uh, in that uh, location. So this can be also mapped. And then we found out an area on the epicardial surface on the inferolateral location where you have normal wavefront going on, but over a period of time, it suddenly becomes slow in this location. And this was suggestive of abnormal area uh, during, our ablation, uh, during our ablation. So this is a patient subcutaneous uh, ICD. We were in the epicardial surface and then doing this ablation. Now, during the procedure, we, we were able to put our catheter in that abnormal area. We were able to induce VT and we could see a lot of this abnormal fractionated signals which were targeted for uh, ablation. Again, this slowing of conduction suggesting that this is going to predispose for further reentrant uh, arrhythmias and, uh, and ablation was performed. He did well. He subsequently had further recurrences of VT, but again, with combination of high doses of amiodarone, currently he's doing well. He still has ongoing inflammation going on, and then we kind of uptitrated and, and modified his immunosuppression to see if that can help him. So VT ablation generally are challenging, but in sarcoid, it, uh, they are the hardest thing to do. Again, an autopsy picture, we can see all this scar is so patchy and you could have all VTs coming from different parts of this ventricle. So, and there is diffuse involvement. There is both RV, LV, and epicardial involvement, heterogeneous scar. And that's why it is very difficult to ablate these VTs that you can ablate one VT at today, but a different VT is going to come out at some point. It is also a progressive disease and the substrate is dynamic. And that's why it makes it even more difficult to target these VTs. The other reason is that because it likes to hang out more on the septum and a septum, you have, have more conduction system, more chance of particular VT, more chance of fascicular triggers to have a ventricular fib, uh, uh, fibrillation. These are again difficult to ablate and again some unique strategies are involved. And despite all that, the recurrence of ventricular tachycardia is quite high in patients with uh, sarcoid uh, heart disease. So that's so from our heart rhythm standpoint, we have to keep on working to see how we can best uh, uh, optimize the ablation strategy. Now, lastly, we'll talk about how to risk stratify a patient with cardiac sarcoid. So identifying patients at risk for sudden death is kind of a tough thing to do. We all know that low ejection fraction is a good indicator that who is going to have a risk of sudden cardiac death. But beyond that, at least in sarcoid, you can look at cardiac MRI and then try to see if there is late gadolinium enhancement that may indicate scar and fibrosis. If there is some edema, that may suggest inflammation. 
PET is again going to show us inflammation and, um, and some perfusion. Cardiac endomyocardial biopsy is going to be helpful. And uh, kind of an added modification of that is that if an electrophysiologist does that biopsy by mapping, that may make the yield of the tissue even more important, uh, more uh, high yield. And then EP study has some role in trying to see whether we could uh, 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 we could uh, uh, predict who is going to have recurrent VT uh, uh, after the diagnosis. So late gadolinium enhancement is it is clearly known that in a based on multiple studies and meta analysis that if you have late gadolinium enhancement in patients with sarcoid then more chance that they are going to have higher mortality, more chance they are going to have arrhythmogenic event. But it's interesting to know that the utility of MRI in risk stratifying patients with uh, cardiac sarcoid is highest whenever the ejection fraction is normal. So we know that with low EF, we probably can have a better idea how, whom to offer an ICD. But in patients with normal EF, if there is significant amount of late gadolinium enhancement, then at least we know that they might be at a higher risk for having arrhythmogenic events. PET scan is important and there are multiple now societal guidelines about how to image cardiac sarcoid from PET standpoint. And uh, you know the whole premise is that there is active inflammation going on uh, in areas which are rich uh, in areas uh, such as septum and a lot of other places in the heart, patchy involvement. These areas have higher metabolic rate and increased glucose utilization. Now, normal myocardium in a post-prandium state also utilizes glucose, but if we can suppress this glucose uptake in the normal myocardium so that most of the glucose get updated, up, uh, 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 update, uh, up kind of uptake happens in the abnormal area, that would be our way to do the PET scan. Now, it's difficult to do that because you can't just order a PET scan and see what happens because the preparation to get a sarcoid PET scan is very different than preparation to get a kind of an ischemia related uh, a PET scan. So this is uh, at least the Mayo protocol about how we do this. One option would be to consider what I call it as an intermittent fasting. So you can fast for 18 hours before the test. Second option is a keto diet, almost like a keto diet. So you can have a lot of, lot of fatty sausages with fried in oil or butter and hamburger patties and steak and everything else. So some people enjoy doing that. Sometimes we also joke that after a PET scan for sarcoid with all this food, what people are eating, they may get a PET scan for ischemia. But something to think about that with the preparation here is going to be very, very different. And that preparation is actually going to be the make and break whether you can actually identify inflammation uh, for uh, sarcoid patients. Now risk stratification based on PET scan is also uh, done fairly commonly, but where it really helps is to understand what part of the heart is involved. So if you have a normal perfusion in an FDG, you are going to do pretty well, but if there is abnormal perfusion and FDG uptake, then more chance of dying, more chance of VT. And also, if there is right ventricular involvement, more chance that you're going to have uh, VT and uh, mortality. So something to think about that we can't really forget the right ventricle when we are treating sarcoid. But where it becomes really tricky, that even 13% of patients with a normal PET scan can have ventricular arrhythmias that follow up. So it doesn't mean that today if the PET scan is normal, then we are, you know, we don't have to worry about these patients, but they have to have some ongoing follow-up going on because as sarcoid is an evolving condition, at some point, if there is more inflammation, they may start to get more ventricular arrhythmias. So it can't really be like a snapshot kind of a care and it has to be an ongoing care for these patients. PET scan is also helpful to look at uh, the uh, the treat the, to look at the efficacy of treatment. So this is somebody again before treatment. A lot of these lymph nodes have lit up, but after a PET after a steroid, it's amazing that the whole PET scan looks beautiful. That and, and the inflammation is gone down along with the lymph nodes. So it can be a good test to follow up to see you know whether uh, the treatment what we are offering is really helpful. So the question comes up, which is a better test for sarcoid? Is it the PET scan or, or is it a cardiac MRI? So again, I'm not a cardiac imager, but at least the way I look at these things, at least when we get referrals, is that it really depends on the local in institutional expertise that should influence the test choice and not really which test should be done for what. 
because we all know from for most of the imaging study there is going to be some intervariability between the readers so i think as long as there is a local institutional expert in at least in one or the of the two imaging modality it's going to be helpful one can go with either test as an initial test but mri has distinct advantages because there is no radiation involved it is not really dependent on the preparation and the failure rate is low but pet also has distinct advantages that it can actually help us to track these active uh, active disease look at response to therapy and also it we, we may not get artifacts if somebody has a device in place uh, if you do a ct pet compared to a uh, cardiac mri there are newer things such as uh, pet mri which are being done right now and we'll wait to see what those data shows ep study has some role and you know we can all induce vf in in all of our hearts but the thing is if we start to see monomorphic vt then that is going to be somewhat helpful then somebody with fibrosis or somebody who has granulomas where the inflammation is gone down if the ep study is positive then more likelihood that they are going to have a likely recurrent vt vf down the line so really you know for it's kind of an unknown that how much ep study is really going to help but at least the way i think about it that if it is inducible vt it's kind of non specific in active inflammation i almost use the corollary it's like inducing vt vf in somebody with with ongoing ischemia so you know that may be a little bit non specific but when the inflammation is treated and now there is scar then we can and if there are, there is inducible vt then certainly icd and ablation can be uh, considered in those patients now biopsy is also uh, done and this is specifically for cardiac biopsy that although we all are going to go to the septum and take up a, a chunk of tissue to see but again like we talked about sarcoid has kind of a, a kind of varied presentations in the heart rv lv involvement septal epicardial involvement so really we have to find out the right tissue to see whether that is going to give us the maximum yield of seeing this non caseating granuloma there are always certainly complications which are involved so in which condition biopsy really helps is that if you have a diffuse process so if you have amyloid if there is transplant related rejection then more chance we are able arbc then more chance you are going to have a better yield of the biopsy but sarcoid because of patchy presentation mid myocardial scar it's almost very difficult to get a good uh, or the right sample to make a diagnosis so can we make this better so again it comes down to our concept of slowing of conduction in the heart or fractionated qrs what we saw on the ecg or on the mapping what i showed you some delayed signals so if we can map the heart rv lv and then try to see for these abnormal signals then and biopsy those abnormal signals if it's in a safe location the yield of the biopsy actually goes up quite uh, high compared to random biopsies uh, without uh, uh, ep guided uh, techniques so we can tag the biotome to our mapping system and then map the ventricle and then try to see if we can get a tissue so this is again in an example that you can biopsy some part here but if the sarcoid is hanging out somewhere here you are going to miss biopsying these uh, this uh, this area so at least what we do is that we map the heart this is how a normal signal is going to look like this is how an abnormal signal is going to look like so if we find an area of abnormal signal which is in a safe location then that gets biopsied and then we may have a better yield so this is how we do it we keep on mapping and then once we find an area then that particular area can be uh, biopsied uh, and then try to see if we can get a good yield we have done this mostly for uh, right ventricular side sometimes for lv side also the key thing with left ventricular biopsy there is always a risk of stroke and tia we have had one patient who had that so we give them kind of anticoagulation for at least 3 months after left lv biopsy to to make sure that we don't have uh, strokes in these kind of patients so just reflecting back on whatever we have talked so far so sarcoid is a very complex condition to treat with all this patchy involvement mid myocardial involvement septal involvement right ventricular involvement atrial involvement and you know it's 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 tough to treat because a you know there is going to be progression of disease patients have lot of symptoms they may have heart blocks and then devices and management of devices they may have immuno they may have they might have immunosuppression going on 
and then someone has to manage that somebody has to manage the prophylactic antibiotics maybe the vaccines in these patients if they be become progressively more and more worse then you may have to consider more heart advanced heart failure options potential transplant options so it becomes a very tough thing to treat just for one particular person now for following the uh, effect of treatment these patients also get a recurrent imaging so there has to be kind of a dedicated team by which we can potentially do that so at mayo clinic here we have a cardiac sarcoid clinic which is head by an heart failure cardiologist who does day to day management there are at least four of them who do uh, purely cardiac sarcoid practice there are two three electrophysiologists who are interested in this so we do at least the procedure related visits manage the arrhythmias and do e consults specifically for risk stratification just as a workflow and based on that we try to see whether we can get them in the clinic or in the lab uh, for further uh, for the stratification there is a pulmonologist and a rheumatologist involved because a lot of these patients will have multi system card a sarcoid so to manage the immunosuppression and some of the newer things which are happening in immuno in immunology and we have a dedicated group of cardiac imagers who are expert in pet and or mri so at least the same person is reading that scan a scan over a period of time to again to reduce the inter observer uh, variability so typically patients who get referred to our clinic is to evaluate for cardiac sarcoid or as we say rule out cardiac sarcoid but anyone who has conduction system abnormalities which is kind of unusual or at their age refractory arrhythmias abnormal imaging studies are the kind of people who get uh, referred to our cardiac sarcoid clinic now we all know that 2020 has been quite a challenging year for everybody a lot of the learning has been and all the meetings are going on um, online on zoom and other platforms social media is ripe for learning and uh, dissemination of uh, knowledge so in kind of the pre hashtag era of uh, say 2019 or 2018 if someone tells you to jump off the cliff you know there's no way anybody is going to do that but kind of in a post hashtag era if you just put a hashtag jump off the cliff challenge everybody is going to start jumping off the uh, of the cliff so this is important to know that you know a lot of times on social media we learn things and just because somebody else is saying it we start to do we start doing those things not even in medicine but also in life intermittent fasting keto diet exercise you know weight loss a lot of things happen based on that in sarcoid it becomes a little bit tricky if you apply this principle because there is really no big data to understand how to effectively treat these patients so there is a need of the hour to really call for expert centers uh, where you can formulate see more patients come up with good treatment options and algorithms and diagnostic testing and therapeutic options to try to see how best we can uh, treat um, this challenging condition so in conclusion think of cardiac sarcoid in young patients with av block very very important that everybody with uh, in a young patient with av block we should get screened for sarcoid look for cardiac involvement in patients with multi system sarcoid vt management is quite tough but it is doable but patients have to be prepped that this is going to be a recurring deal especially for sarcoid vt and and more more ablations epicardial ablations potentially surgical ablations it is really going to be a team approach about how to manage these ventricular tachycardias sarcoid is unique that the risk stratification for sudden death is really not based on ejection fraction alone and we have to look at other things such as ecg potentially advanced imaging such as mr pet such as potentially ep study all these things can go a play a long way in looking for risk stratification for sudden death and finally i think we need a coordinated multidisciplinary approach to critically take care of these uh, patients because it is quite variable everybody's sarcoid is different some patients get sick very very early some patients don't get sick at all so you know every patient is teaching us something new as the disease being quite dynamic the presentation keeps on changing so i think i'll stop here thank you very much for your patient listening and i'm happy to take any questions thank you so much dr deshmukh that was really Uh, review on sarcoidosis. Uh, I'm sure we all learned a lot, um, and we really appreciate you presenting. I know it's early in the study. Um, I'm going to go ahead and um, open it up for questions. And while people are putting in questions in the chat box, um, actually we have a question here. 
Um, are there any studies looking at success of VT ablation depending on stage of sarcoid, meaning yes. inflammation versus scar fibrosis alone? Yes, no, I think that's a great question. And I didn't show you that slide for a reason. So there is a recent international cardiac sarcoid consortium, which actually reported that if an ablation is done in setting of ongoing inflammation, the outcomes are going to be much poorer compared to an ablation done when there is fibrosis or scar. So if you have fibrosis or scar, we can ablate that area and we can also anchor it to a neighboring anatomical structure so that at least we create some sort of line of block. But in active inflammation, as there is no consolidation of the fibrosis or scar, even if we ablate there, there is going to be more ongoing inflammation. So it can't be just VT ablation is going to take care of the VT. It is going to be controlling of inflammation, which is going to be paramount in controlling VT. But we have done some cases where there is ongoing inflammation. They are in storm type situation, BF storm. But if there is a particular PVC, which is initiating this tachycardia, that certainly can be mapped and ablated. But I think the point is well taken that generally in active inflammation, we don't do ablation unless there is uh, something going on. So along the same lines then, if there's active inflammation, um, do you ever say, like if somebody's hospitalized, do you say I'm going to treat the inflammation and send them out with a vest for a couple of weeks and then come back for uh, an ICD? So that's a good question. There's actually one study which has looked at life fest and sarcoid and the, the, the life fest shock rates were quite high in that group. A lot of those patients also had low ejection fraction, but somebody has concerning ventricular arrhythmias, you know, getting admitted, especially for sarcoid, they always go home with a permanent device and we generally don't do uh, life fest in that particular uh, patient. Dr. Smith just asked the second patient you presented yes. got a sub-Q ICD, is future heart block not a concern? Great question. And we debated a lot whether to give him a transvenous ICD or a subcutaneous ICD. But if you look at, remember his picture, his EF was normal. He had normal PR, normal ECG, and really no risk of uh, hard block what we had seen. So based on the EP, he had late gadolinium enhancement on the interolateral wall. His septum was not involved. So we felt if the septum is not involved, again, less chance he's going to have AV block. So an interolateral wall was involved. So we thought, you know, an EP study as we had inducible VT, we, we wanted, we offered him a device and he just wanted to keep it, uh, he didn't want a conventional transvenous device. So we gave him a subcutaneous ICD. This also brings up a main question about shared decision making when we offer ICD. So we have to discuss pros and cons of everything. And based on this patient, he was an active guy and this whole diagnosis came out of the blue for him. Actually, when he got the VT, he was exercising and he didn't want anything to compromise with his uh, weight lifting and exercises. So we didn't do a transvenous ICD for him and got a subcutaneous ICD. Thank you. Um, we have Dr. Balk who's asked a question. Um, Dr. Balk, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Sure, I have uh, two questions. One is about ACE levels, or whether they play a role at all. And then number two, I actually have a patient who we're in the middle of this diagnosis that I'm seeing back tomorrow. So I'm looking for some advice. He's got a long history of an anomalous right coronary that's asymptomatic, not ischemic, and has done well for the last 10 or 15 years. And then just recently started getting palpitations and has these long runs of ventricular tachycardia. And his MRI shows, um, not in the septum, but anterior and anterolateral suggestive of sarcoid. And his question to me is, what's the next best test, meaning biopsy, PET, referral to Mayo, EP study, et cetera. His EF is normal. So great question. So again, it comes down, I, I, I'll try to see if I can show you the slide again of normal ejection fraction. But basically anomalous right coronary artery and his uh, uh, PET or his cardiac MRI or something light, lit up in the anterior anterolateral location. So unlikely that's going to be the cause. Now, if he does have uh, MRI, which has shown late gadolinium enhancement, then the next step is really, and he has VT already documented. And if he's having long runs of those VTs, and if those VT morphology is consistent with VT exit from the anterior anterolateral wall, then I would just offer him a device because you know, uh, you know, because he's having all this VT. 
EP study can be considered. And if, you know, if on EP study, if we can show that he has inducible VT, then we can make a stronger case for an ICD. But uh, I think if, if this gentleman is, you know, that symptomatic, he should get an ICD. And once he gets the ICD, then he should potentially get treated. Now, your second question is that whether he should, I, I suppose he got an MRI before, right? Whether he's, he should, he's correct. He's had an MRI, but only that. Hasn't had a chest x-ray yet. I probably need to do that. Good. So the second question is whether he should get a PET scan. And, you know, you know, we would like to do all the testing possible for all the patients, because at least at Mayo, there is a saying that we can't make you feel like a million bucks till the time we do a million bucks for you, as far as spending all that money for you is concerned. So, you know, certainly PET can be done because PET can be a good marker over a period of time to see how the inflammation gets treated. So MRI is a good initial test, but as a follow-up, PET might be helpful. Easier said than done. But I also know our heart failure colleague who runs the Sarquad clinic, he's on the phone two hours every day trying to get all this pre-authorization done for follow-up PET scans. So that sometimes becomes very, very challenging to do it. But in an ideal world, certainly PET can be done. But as regards to your question, he should definitely get an ICD. Now, your first question was about ACE levels. So again, you know, from heart EP standpoint, I don't follow them on a longitudinal basis, but ACE levels, again, can be a good marker for uh, trying to see how they respond to treatment. And overall, they do have low sensitivity and specificity. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Any other questions from our audience? Okay. Well, if there are no more questions, then um, we'll go ahead and uh, close uh, this um, grand round. Thank you again so much for uh, presenting, and uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Have a great day. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.